Hello, everybody. Hey, hey, I'm not a vampire. Um, my name is Max Robbins, and I'm the executive director of the Center for Communications. Um, for those of you who don't know who we are, um, we represent a very diverse community of the best minds in media, both students and indus industry professionals. Um, we have a very specific mission, and that's to connect the next generation of media leaders with the leaders of today. Um, tonight is the kickoff of our spring season. Not only are we screening What Do We Do in the Shadows by the guys who brought you Flight of the Con Concords, but we have the stars and the filmmakers here tonight. So the first question, obviously, when, when did you start thinking about doing a, a vampire mockumentary? It's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about 10 years ago. OK. We, uh, Tark and I used to do a, on stage at a comedy club, we did a couple of vampire characters where I come up on stage and it was something like I got up dressed as a vampire telling vampire jokes or stories and then Tyker's character would stand up from the audience and start booing me and heckling me and I'd say, my old vampire rival, are you, why have you followed me over the centuries heckling me? And we did that. <laughs> and then years, a couple of years later. I don't remember any of that. Can't remember. You remember dressing up as a vampire? Yeah, that was Halloween for me when I was a kid. Yeah. Well, also, we did go to a party dressed as vampires where no one else was dressed up. I don't remember that either. You don't remember that? And my friend Todd was like a... No, my friend Anthony was, was, a, was an axe murderer and we were vampires. And no one else was dressed up at all. Um, and then I watched... Oh, I remember that. <laughs> then I watched this movie, movie Nadja, and the next day I said to Taika, let's make it, let's get those... <laughs> He's learning this. I'm fascinated by this. <laughs> let's do something with those vampire characters. And um, we just started adding other people into the story. And at first I was imagining a more grand movie, not a documentary that... Um, just spanned over centuries, so it would start, you know, might start 600 years ago. Um, and then we, we decided to shoot like a little short film thing to um, just test out the characters and just to see if the idea was even worth turning into a feature. And, so uh, we hired some costumes, like spent 150 bucks <laughs> out of and costume We never company. made back. <laughs> That's and, true. Um, we might make it back now. <laughs> and, um, uh, yeah, so we dressed up and then we... Um, we it was like just frilly shirts and like, yeah. you know, sort of... Um, we did our makeup ourselves and when you watch it, the makeup ends here at the chin because we didn't really know to do the neck. <laughs> so how long ago was the test? Ten years ago. The test was ten years ago? 2005, oh, wow. yeah. Oh, wow. So when did you sort of get serious about making a, this, this movie? Um, if we were year. serious then. Every year we thought we were serious. We always thought we were serious. Every year we'd say, this is the year. <laughs> Nobody's doing vampire. The, this, vampires aren't in popular culture. This right. is the year. <laughs> and then every year a new thing would come out. And we'd be like, oh, just this true blood thing. Right. And, uh, and then... And then eventually... Oops. It changes. <laughs> they can give you all the mics you Sorry. want, but not a, not a good chair. <laughs> People's attitudes change. That's another 150 bucks somehow. <laughs> <I'm out. laughs> Did you, I mean, what specific vamp, I mean, I, you get a sort of, uh, being a New Zealand movie, a sort of forgotten silver vibe from this, yeah. obviously. Um, what were the sort of the, some of the other inspirations? Um, Spinal Tap, this is Spinal Tap, right. um, obviously. I was inspired by Grey Gardens, because I thought that, you know, that these, um, these vampires living in this decrepit old house and full of mold and stuff was sort of, yeah, it was a bit similar. Right. We kind of have, when we've talked about this before, we often have completely different lists of films that inspired us. We wrote it together, but um, yeah, one for me was Some Kind of Monster. That's the documentary following Metallica. And the way you never, you don't know who's going to be the main person they follow in that film. It's a surprise. So we wanted that kind of feeling too, that you don't necessarily have a protagonist. It might, it might be someone who doesn't turn up for 30 minutes who you end up following a lot. And how did you sort of fill out the, the cast uh, and come up with these other sort of uh, vampire, you know, archetypes? Well, we, um, when we did the short film thing, we've, our characters are pretty similar to the ones we did 10 okay. years ago. And um, 
Not the same, though. Not exactly the same. We have um, l- lighter necks. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think we kind of... The way I see it is we bait, like, Jermaine's characters, like the Coppola, Dracula, like the classic Thank Dracula you. kind nice. of style. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my one is pretty much exactly like Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt. Um, <laughs> And then Johnny's one is sort of like the Lost Boys, That's West deep. Coast, like Venice Beach <laughs> vampire. Could be a vampire or just someone in leather clothes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and then Nick, I guess, represented like the new, the changing of the guard, like the new, um, this influx of like Twilight and these right. hipster, well, so hipster vampires, yeah. sensitive, sparkly <laughs> vampires. The kind of comedy that Tyker and I did and the other guy, Johnny, Johnny Bruff, who played Deacon, did, was uh, big and theatrical, and um, the guy who played Nick was playing clubs, and he was very subtle and small and mumbles. It's hard to understand him sometimes. So he was kind of a new guy on the scene, so we just sort of replicated our relationship in the comedy scene in, in Wellington. And what about Stu? Is that always a character? Stu, um, actually, in the short film that we made, Stu was my flatmate at the time. And um, Stu actually does, he's not an actor, he does IT in real life. <laughs> and, um, so Stu was just helping us out by carrying gear and stuff when we were walking through town. And um, he doesn't talk much. Um, he's literally playing himself. <laughs> literally. Like he wore his own clothes. And he... Um, he went back to even when you hear like, when when he's describing his job in the film, that's his job. <laughs> so when people are looking at him, looking confused, that's real because nobody, even I, still don't know, understand what he does. He's a <laughs> geo database software al- analyst. I don't know if any of you could make sense of what he does, but that's what he he did at the time. And um, I remember one one time when we. He's a great guy. He's a really good guy. As we, he's exactly as we portray him. Like he's. He's, he's just always like, you there. say, oh, you want to go to a movie? He's the first one. He's like, yeah, I'll come. And he's like, <laughs> he set up the wireless, the Wi-Fi router at my mum's house. <laughs> set up your guy's router. That's right. <laughs> I mean, he's just so, so, so helpful. I wish he was here. I wish you guys could meet him. <laughs> <laughs> me too. He would um, fix all that. He'd make this all streamlined for yeah. me. <laughs> he went back to his 2005 haircut for the film, though. He's got a cooler haircut now in real life, but... He, he did, brushed it back forward to, <laughs> to be his nerdy 2005 self. Well, the, the movie is great because it has this idea of the vampires being the sort of metaphor for how cool you are. They all, they all want to be cooler than each other, and it's this great sort of metaphor. When did you sort of hit on, on that initially? Was it something you discovered, or was it always there? That, that's mm. in everything Taika does. Yeah. My, everything I do is about people trying to be cooler than they are. <laughs> I'm well, just interested in those types of people. And uh, how did you sort of, what was the sort of division of labor like? Because you're both in it, you co-wrote it, you're both directing. Uh, did somebody handle one thing and somebody else the other, or, or what was that like? Yeah, well, we wrote everything together, and then we actually didn't, um, we, f- so we'd re- we wrote a script, but we didn't show it to the actors. And so the whole film is about the idea 90, of- sort of 95% improvised. Okay. The idea behind that being um, that the performances would be more natural if they hadn't memorised their lines and they were coming up with it naturally. So did you guys just create sort of scenarios for each character? We've written, yeah. we've, we've written the script and the script is a, an okay movie. Okay. Um, but <laughs> we would just describe it and occasionally we might have a rule so we might have in a, so what Tug was about to say is that he mostly dealt with the uh, the crew and I mostly dealt with the actors. Okay. But when dealing with the actors, Sam, we might give them a list of insults. For the for the part with the werewolves, we'd give them a list of insults to call us. We'd say, try and swear at us. And we'd give Reese Darby, if, if they swear, say, werewolves, not swearwolves. That's your <laughs> one major role. That's the most important thing to you, that these guys don't swear. <laughs> um, and then sort of let it go and then do it over and over again and s- to try and get a scene together. There are some, some great sort of visual effects stuff in this. Was it hard to sort of maintain that while in this improvised kind of environment? Or was that stuff very Well, that stuff on? had to be all set up and right. we had to plan that. And, um, well, that's the most exciting part It's just part the dialogue that's imp- improvised. Like, we knew story-wise like, what had to happen. And, um, you know, we would like... So 
but only we knew. Right. Yeah. But we'd have to say, um, John, you're going to, Corey's going to say that he, uh, he alerted the vampire hunters, hunter to us being a vampire, uh, va- being vampires. You're going to chase him up these stairs. You're going to go around here and then you're going to run in this room that's going to turn around and round while you're in it. Right. And then you improvise the lines while just, you're up there. And then like, you have to just slip like Inception. Inception. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly the same. And was it always built around the, the, the unholy masquerade? Was that always sort of... That felt very Christopher yeah. Guest to me. Sort of like... Yeah, I think that... Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, it does. Well, no, it wasn't we that early. We always thought it, it should early. be something... Like it, yeah, w- the, the masquerade thing, we, we really didn't know. This is something even you when we were on. shooting, Even when we were shooting, we didn't know if um, the beast was going to be a guy or a girl. Okay. And <laughs> whether it was going to be an ex-girlfriend or a rival. Or rival right. And, uh, and, and um, that was something you suggested. I remember having some some point that you, you're you um, heading towards, but that's not the unholy masquerade we'd imagined. We'd imagine <laughs> these terrifying vampires and budget. be much more threatening and, you know, transformations and all this kind of thing, but we just didn't have time to do that, so we went for, oh, it's another crappy party. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so well, many times... <laughs> the, it's just a Wellington party. <laughs> <laughs> so many times the gag is we're set up for something big. Often we had a in imagine something big right. but then and this is what we could afford <laughs> <laughs> We're, there's three of us on a bus <laughs> was there more sort of horror uh, in it before there are a couple of good there scares. Are a few things yeah. that we um, we didn't put in just because of time and and um, you know like our VFX budget was pretty small so like you know right and it was so really paid down, to the, down to the wire <laughs> at some point where you know, we just needed effects back and sometimes they were like, so overworked they're like we're just you can't have that one right <laughs> you a can't lot have that shot and uh, a lot of the, cut it out a lot of the VFX people were working in their lunch breaks and after work from doing The Hobbit <laughs> they were like wet freelancers yeah, yeah yeah that's pretty cool Did yeah you? yeah it's really easy to find good VFX people in Wellington now everyone's been taught how to do it <laughs> right <laughs> Especially in between Hobbits, which yeah, yeah, doesn't yeah. seem like there was, was that much. Yeah, we used a lot of, um, we were sort of like this, a kind of like a, par- a crew of parasites who just fed off like whatever the Hobbit threw away, <laughs> and, um, including people. And our, even our, our whole crew was their second unit. Oh, really? We had to wait till they finished filming, and then we just kept them. We used the cameras from the Hobbit. Um, <laughs> the, um, Thank God you didn't use the 48 frames. No, that's that right. But, um, no, so Peter um, gave us a couple of cameras to use and a bunch of lights and stuff. So that, yeah, that, he was pretty generous. And um, the, the set is made of the old green screen from The Hobbit. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> that they threw away and we scavenged that's and uh, <laughs> turned into a house. Did he offer any advice? He's sort of the king of the horror comedy. He's just the king. The king. He's, he's, he's the, the king of New Zealand. Yeah. yeah. He didn't offer advice, but we did have a meeting with him early on to see if he could help, and he was very enthusiastic, so I think that spurred us on a little. <laughs> mm. He needs to make another horror movie, for sure. Mm. Um, what was the editing process like? Because I'm sure... Boring. You guys, was yeah. it? You, got, you, you had all this great it material 14, on the cinema. It took 14 months. Wow. Um, Shooting was five weeks of fun, right? and then followed by 14 months of tedious <laughs> sitting in front of us. Because you were using the Hobbit's editors? And, yeah. <laughs> Old, you, we used to use editors. Um... <laughs> What is wrong with you guys? Okay. So um, the, the uh, edit took 14 months because we had improvised everything. We had about 140 hours of footage. And um, then we had to find 85 minutes. So every, minutes, every 10 minutes. hours of footage is another month. Yeah. <laughs> is there anything on the DVD that you're like really excited for people to see? Or was it all cut for a reason? Uh, a, a lot of the good stuff was cut for time. And also for... like There was a... Uh, did, uh, the Peter funeral scene that, um, that we had, and that was cut because um, some of the comments were it was just too sad. Oh, there was a few well, sad beats not, one after the other. Yeah, it's and not that, that it was that sad. One. It was one of my favourite scenes, but just too many in a row. Uh, he dies, and then we eject Nick and Stew, and then you know 
then we'd have a funeral and something else. There was too many things in a row. It, it, it slowed the pace down. Well, the movie is... Uh, but that will be an extra feature. There's like two hours of extra stuff oh, for really? DVD. Great. Uh, the movie is very sweet. And that's, I think, sort of very surprising for people. All you guys. <laughs> uh, was it hard to kind of strike that? Because not only are you doing horror comedy, but also this kind of like, you know, there's some real emotion there. Was that sort of hard to, to strike, that balance? Yeah, well, that was why it took so long, I think, is um, not, a, not, not only having to watch all the footage, but find the balance between comedy and story. And cause we wanted it to be super funny, but often, like, the first, the earlier cuts, we just put nothing but jokes in and didn't concentrate on story and no one really cared about the characters or paid attention to the film. And then um, <laughs> That's afterwards... That's the Just Jokes version. <laughs> and then later on, then we tried a version where we just concentrated purely on story and it wasn't very funny. Right. But Understandable, the, but not that funny. <laughs> and, uh, but so the, but, you, but you cared a lot. Yeah. yeah. The drama bits were kind of the f first things that we thought of, like um, Tiger's character being in love with someone who had moved on and he still hasn't moved on. Those kind of things were the, the um, dramatic parts were the first things we thought of in the But story. also, we find that stuff funny. Right. Uh, can you talk about the, sort of the rollout of the movie? Because I saw it back at South by last year. It premiered at Sundance here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what has that whole journey been like? And now you partnered with Funny or Die uh, yeah. to bring it out, right? Yeah, um, and we just um, our Kickstarter campaign to um, raise money to get it to more cities across America just finished about an hour ago, and we were successful. So right, we made it. Oh, nice! Well, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> so it yes. means that it go. It, yeah, so it opens LA and New York this weekend tomorrow. And then, um, then the next weekend is like ten or fifteen more cities, and then each week is like more and more. And we, I think, we're finishing with like seventy cities. Oh, yeah, wow. I think we've got seventy, which is if we had if we had sold it here, then I think it would probably be about half as many cities. So hopefully, people go. Now, are you guys going to work? I mean, I know you've worked together before, but this is the first thing you've co-directed. Is that something that's going to continue? Well, actually, we do, we've done a lot of theatre shows and we kind of co-directed those because we didn't have a director. <laughs> um, but, yeah, this is the... Oh, and the short. But, this, yeah, the first film. Right. Uh, I don't know. I guess we don't need to. No. We don't need to. We might direct each other. Who knows? Mm. I mean, are you going to... We're writing something at the moment. We're okay. writing a pilot for, for the States. Oh, okay. We're going to try and shoot later in the year. For HBO or... Yeah. yeah. Okay. What's, can you give us the log line? No, it's too it's top We don't have one. <laughs> it's an anthology show. Oh, it's cool. about logs. It's about logs. Okay. Great. Um, I think we're now going to have some audience questions. So if anybody wants to come to another one of the two microphones. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, what audience are you thinking about? Are you thinking about like a Kiwi audience or like an international audience? I think we do think a bit about the audience. Like we, like, there was one bit where we... The, the bit where Deacon talks about being a Nazi. And um, we had a big discussion after Sundance because nobody really laughed at that joke here. Yeah, we played and, it in um, New Zealand, uh, tested it out, and there was a big laugh. Especially, what's different is the certain kind of humour. People in other countries, this is what they're saying about Americans, that Americans don't do irony, they don't understand it. And I don't agree with that, but there's a kind of irony that doesn't translate here. And there's the part where, where Deacon says, I don't know if you know, but the Nazis lost the war. <laughs> and, and that's a really big joke in New Zealand. In New Zealand. Zealand. It's like, <laughs> in but New people Zealand, here in the audience were like, oh, of course we know that. Well, you're the same. <laughs> it's the same line, because in New Zealand we go, yes, of course we know that, that's funny. And then in America, of course we know that, that's not funny. <laughs> so, there's something, there's just in a couple of little moments where... But the joke's dead. We left it, yeah. yeah. We, we didn't know if it had ever come out here, so we did uh, <laughs> The dream came true. I just want to thank you guys for coming out. Thank you for thank having you us. Thank you guys so much.